Uh, this is Bill Gates. Hopefully the video will be intelligible enough. News on Washington targeting the big tech companies and looking to potentially break them up, definitely regulate them more. I wonder if that gives you flashbacks as to your own time running ah. Microsoft. And, and I just, yeah. <laughs> what Watch advice would you give these CEOs who are dealing with this right now? Well, I think whenever you get to be a super valuable company, you know, affecting the way people communicate and even, you know, political discourse being mediated through your system and, you know, higher percentage of commerce uh, uh, through your system, you go, you're going to expect a lot of government attention. Now, notice he's, he's, he's not going to be critical of that. You're going to accept a lot of government attention that, unfortunately, in the world in which we live, that is absolutely true. And he, you know, at least here, I'm sure in private, he might say something different. But at least here, that's value neutral in his mind, right? It, it, it doesn't elicit a condemnation. It doesn't elicit uh, uh, any kind of anger. It, it, when he was asked about this, you saw him kind of smile and laugh. You'll see him smile and laugh later on as well. Uh, that seems to be a defense mechanism. The whole experience of, of antitrust was not a pleasant experience for Bill Gates at all. It was actually a disaster. I'll read you some quotes about it afterwards. Um, it was a disaster from a, 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 a PR perspective. It was a disaster, I think, for, for his uh, legacy. It was a disaster for the company. The whole experience was, was, was horrific. And, uh, but he can't process it, really, because as you'll see, he has no principles. He has no moral framework or even political philosophical framework to frame what happened at Microsoft to him. It's just... It's just, yeah, if you're big, you're going to attract government, government attention. And it, and it truly is sad because I have to say that when I watch Bill Gates' videos, he strikes me as a nice guy, obviously brilliant, and it would be amazing, amazing if somebody as successful as him were principled, took the objectivist ideas seriously. Imagine if that happened, the, the, the kind of... Uh, what an earth-shattering event that would be. I mean, it would be uh, unbelievable. If one of these tech guys turned out to be a huge, uh, turned out to be an objectivist, th that, would be, that would take us forward 20 years in terms of visibility in the culture, in terms of influence in the culture, in terms of importance in the culture. Un unfortunately, almost all of them are pragmatists. It's not that they're leftists or on the right. They're just pragmatists, and uh, they don't have a coherent philosophy. Now, Bill Gates has been influenced by some pretty bad philosophy. Uh, I think primarily by John Rawls, by, by kind of an egalitarian philosophy, but he's not an egalitarian. It's not like he believes everybody should be equal in any kind of sense. But there's a, a drag, a tinge, a, a pull on him, and you see this in other interviews, of not completely feeling comfortable with the fact that he's as rich and successful as he is even though I think he thinks he deserves it. I was naive at Microsoft and didn't really... Naive. He was naive at Microsoft. He's still naive. And, and it's not naivete. It, you know, he was innocent in a Microsoft. He was, he was running a company. He was busy running a company. He, 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 and he says, listen to what he says here. I realized uh, that our success would lead to government attention. And so I... You know, I made some mistakes, uh, you know, just saying, hey, I never go to Washington. He did. He, he said, I never go to Washington. I'm not interested in Washington. I'm not interested in what Washington has to say. You leave us alone. We'll leave you alone. We, we, what's the point in going to Washington? I'm running the largest company in the world, most successful company in the world. Why would I go to Washington? Now, that is a great attitude. That is the right attitude. I wish these executives today would refuse to go to Washington. But he has caved on that attitude. He today regrets that attitude. He's saying that attitude is naive because you know what? When you, go to when you don't go to Washington, what happens? They come to you. If you don't go and try at least to defend yourself against the gun, what happens? The gun shows up in your house. And this is the whole point where libertarians and others talk about cronyism and the evil of cronyism and these businessmen are all cronies what choice do they have what choice do they have what lesson did they learn from bill gates 
The lesson they learned from Gates is don't be arrogant. Don't stand up to Washington because he tried. Don't ignore Washington. Indeed, you know, participate in the game. Protect yourself. Defend yourself. Hand out money all over the place. Google famously from day one has been giving uh, contributions to the Republican Party, to Democrats, to Democrats, to Republicans, all over the place. Because they understood. They looked at Microsoft. They said, we never want that to happen to us. We need to do more about this. Now, it looks like it's going to happen to them in spite of that. We'll see how it all plays out. And they forgot, I think, to grease the wheels in Europe where they're being harassed. Um, but yeah, it's, it's what are they going to learn from Bill Gates? Play the game. And even Bill Gates has learned from Bill Gates. Play the game. Because for a while he didn't. And he wasn't successful. He's lost. Now, you could argue maybe he lost because he wasn't principled enough. But that's a hard argument to make, given that the people in Washington have the guns and, and can force this on you. Trevor asked, does Bill Gates not understand philosophy or is he evil? I don't think he's evil. I don't think you could say he's evil. I mean, I think he's, I, I don't think he understands philosophy. I think to the extent that he knows somewhat about philosophy, he, he, he's wrong about philosophy. I think he's very confused philosophically in interviews where he talks about his personal life. I think he's torn between his productiveness and his reason and his rationality and between a, a sense that he should be altruistic and a sense that that's right, that there's something just about altruism and there's something just about, uh, about egalitarianism. But he can't actually bring himself to believe that. Uh, so no, I don't think he's, I don't think he's, uh, he's evil at all. I think he's one of the good guys, but very, very, very confused and wrong. And, and, you know, it's not that everybody who evades, uh, I mean, that's immoral to evade is immoral, but not everybody who evades is evil. And, um, I'm sure Bill Gates evades. I'm sure he read Atlas Shrugged and evaded some of its lessons as many of these executives have. But would I call him evil? Never. Never. Right. Uh, Dragon something or says, uh, I hear socialists say the opposite. They say capitalist class owns the government, not the other way around. I've seen that statement numerous times in socialist groups. Now, if that were true, then uh, there would be no antitrust going after business. There would Now, there's been less over the last 30 years since Reagan. There's been less antitrust. That's good, but you'd expect there to be zero. You'd expect there to be very little regulation, regulations that often harm business. You'd expect... Um, so, I, no, I don't see any evidence to suggest that Washington is in the pocket of business. Now, it does... We've created in America, not capitalism. We don't have capitalism anymore, and we don't really have a capitalist class. What we created in America is a mixed economy with a heavy dose of cronyism. So today there is a lot of interface between uh, the, the business and between um, government. But the fault is government. The fault is government's ability, the, f the fact that government has a gun, the fact that government is, is, doesn't have any fear in pointing that gun, and the need of businessmen to defend themselves. That is... At the end of the day, the, the, I think the source of the, of the cronyism. All right. Let's keep going with, uh, and, and now that's the source of it, but it's not the end of it, right? So for example, for example, um, Microsoft today um, filed, uh, joined a lawsuit against Apple claiming antitrust violations for that gaming company. I forget the name of the gaming company. The gaming company, um, here it is. I've got it here. Um, Epic Games. So they joined the Epic Game lawsuit against Apple. So today, 
once they're beaten down, right? Once they're beaten down, businesses join in and businesses use the antitrust laws and businesses use regulation you know to protect themselves and in that sense they protect themselves from competition and they i don't think own government is the right way to do but they have a much uh, you know they 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 have a say and uh, a lot of laws today a lot of congressmen today are uh, are lazy stupid uh, don't want to piss anybody off. So what they do is they write bills that are empty. And then the regulatory agencies fill them in. And the regulatory agencies, in order to fill in what the actual regulations will be, so, uh, Dodd-Frank was like this, actually consult with the industries. The industry sends people to help write the regulations that will regulate it. So it's a complete mess today. It's, it's a complete disaster. But the source of this, and this is really, 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 really important, the source of this, is the power we have given government over our lives. The source of this is the power we have given government over business. And you could see it historically. Whenever government has power over a particular industry, that industry becomes their mask with government. You get the corruption, you get the lobbying, you get the 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 the, 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 the you know the cronyism, starting with the railroad industry in the 19th century and on. But the blame here is by get, that we've given government too much power. Or you could think of it as government has taken, without our objection, too much power. Somebody said uh, Peacock didn't think much of it gets. Yeah, I mean, in a sense that he never stood up for himself in the sense that he never really defended himself on principle. He's always been a pragmatist. And, and you know, philosophically, obviously, given, given his success, given his prominence, given his genius or his brilliance, however you want to categorize it, it would have been great if he had. I still have an immense appreciation for him as a businessman. I have an immense appreciation for him as a technologist. And I have an appreciation for him as... as outside of philosophy, outside of politics, as a thinker. Particularly in technology, business. Here we go. You see, uh, and now I don't think, you know, that naivety is there. These companies have uh, lots of uh, sophisticated advisors and they've tried to engage in various ways. But there's going to be you know, the rules will change somewhat. It is kind of poignant that the tech companies have done so well at a time when, uh, you know, things are very tough. And so uh, that's a, an element of the increased attention. It would be nice, imagine if he'd said, there's envy because they've done so well, instead of just pointing out the fact that when you do so well, it's going to attract attention and people are going to go after you because you've done so well. He could have just said, it's envy. <laughs> But sadly, he won't. And then he says the tech companies are doing a, they're not as naive as I was. They're doing a better job. Now, isn't that sad that today successful companies have to devote huge amounts of resources because Bill Gates lost in the 90s. He lost his case in the 90s. And I get back to that quote in a minute about, about uh, him losing. Uh, yeah, let's keep listening. You think additional regulation could be good? Look at this or, smile now. Let's say for, for America, for consumers overall, or you think it runs that. the risk of, of, of cutting down on innovation? What is that smile telling you? It's telling you, of course I don't think it's going to be good. Of course I think it's going to be cut down on innovation. Of course I think it's terrible. But he's not going to say that. That's what his face tells us. That's what his smile tells us. It's... It'll really depend on what they come up with, uh, you know. <laughs> really? And we have to get here's the pragmatism. Uh, all you know, this. is there some rule about acquisition? Is there some rule about splitting parts of the the companies either uh, to create open? Which is what they wanted to do originally with Microsoft to split up all the companies, his company, and they managed to fight that and get that stopped. They they had other problems, but that at least was not done to Microsoft. And availability of uh, those resources it, it's we're in we're in uncharted territory here a lot of industries like the railroad industry or the movie industry 
they created special policies that they thought were effective for competition. But this is a new industry with, uh, with different issues. And so to get it right uh, will take uh, a lot of a Look lot of that good smile thinking. to get it right uh, as if it's possible. But, a lot of you know, good I'd thinking. I'd say the chances of them doing something uh, is, is pretty high. And you always have uh, Europe as well as the United States, often Europe being uh, even more regulatory. Yep. So you see the pragmatism, but you also see, you know, if, if he was honest, if he let that smile talk, he thinks it's absurd. And he says, you need a lot of good thinking. Well, first, I, I don't believe you could have a lot of good thinking. But, you know, who's going to do this good thinking? There's nobody there to do the good thinking. And he doesn't, somebody says he puts money over principle because he thinks it's rational. No, I don't think he puts money above principles. I don't think this is about money at all. I think this is about, uh, I, I think this is the reality. And he faces that reality and he puts his survival above principle. Look, it, 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 the more he would have fought, the more principled he would have been, the more likely it is that they would have broken up Microsoft and destroyed him. He didn't do it because of the money. It, it, it's about survival. I don't think Bill Gates is an evil socialist. There's, there's nothing about him that's socialist. He's wrong philosophically. He's corrupt philosophically. He's primarily a pragmatist with tinges of, you know, pulled by, by John Rawls-like egalitarianism. Trevor Smith asks... If you were put in charge of Gates Foundation, would you disassociate from Africa? Uh, would that not be objectively better for Africans? No, I don't think it would be objectively better for Africans. I'm not sure why it would be objectively better for Africans. I, I don't think what Trump, what Trump, what uh, Bill Gates is doing in Africa is bad for Africans. I just don't think it's that good for Bill Gates. Uh, and I don't think it's that good for Africa. I think it's better than zero but I don't think it's I don't think it's ideal for Africa. What Africa needs are ideas. What Africa needs is a a pro liberty, pro freedom, pro capitalist ideology. That's what I would promote in Africa if I was going to go to Africa at all. But it's not about right. It's not about the um, uh, damage that. Bill Gates, the Gates Foundation is doing in Africa. I, on the contrary, if, if you value human life, then Gates Foundation is, I think, doing a lot of good for Africa. Not good that'll change anything fundamentally, but it's saving lives in malaria, it's saved lives in polio, it's saving lives in various diseases. It's doing good. I, I don't buy any of the conspiracy theories, any of the uh, stuff about uh, the, the, all the damage that the Gates Foundation is doing in Africa. I don't think that any of that is real. I think it's just, a, a, in a sense, a waste of money. And if they advocated for free markets and capitalism in Africa, that would be a lot better for Africa. If I were put in the... So I would leave Africa not because it's good or bad for Africans, because, but because I think there's more important work to do. And the most important work to do is the work to promote capitalism in the world. And in Africa, in the United States, in Europe, everywhere. And uh, that's where I would focus hundreds of millions of dollars. And that's... Imagine, imagine how you could change the world if that was your focus. If that was your focus. Uh, Gates, awesome productive coverage, couldn't withstand the establishment's fury for challenging the moral zeitgeist. Andrew writes, only moral principles could provide him with the strength. I agree completely. I agree completely. I mean, this is what uh, this author wrote about that uh, trial. Now, the trial at, involved three days of depositions where uh, Bill Gates was queried by a lawyer about details of emails he sent, about this, about that, about policies, about all the minutia that is involved in the government's case that claimed that Microsoft was using its so-called monopoly power to restrict competition. Uh, he says uh, uh, there's a videotaped deposition of Bill Gates. Um, at its most basic level, the deposition underscored the utter contempt he had for an action he believed impringed on the ability of his company and others to follow, he warned, to design products and conduct business as they saw fit. That's great. If that's what he conveyed, that's great. 
but he couldn't convey it in principle. He conveyed it in his attitude. And that's what I think you see with Bill, with Bill Gates. He has an attitude that says, just leave us alone. Just let us do a thing. Of course, regulations will restrict innovation. But he doesn't have the principled, conceptual, philosophical knowledge to say it and to stand by it and to defend it and to fight for it. Emotionally, I think it's there. And maybe at some level cognitively. But he can't fight for it because he's not principled and he doesn't acknowledge principle. He doesn't recognize principle. He won't admit to principle. He says, the strategy during the three-day deposition was classic Microsoft. And this is the pragmatism. Obstruct. Paint the government as out of touch policy wonks who had no idea how tech and real markets worked. That's pragmatism. Now, that's hard to tell if that was Bill Gates' strategy or if it was his lawyer's strategy. That's also you can't tell from these things. right? And above all, deny even the most basic of the premises in the government's case. The plan from Gates' army of lawyers and PR handlers seemed to be to wield his image as a software wonder kid who dropped out of Harvard to bootstrap his company and went on to become the man, world's richest man. Team Gates planned to use that same domineering force of will to beat back government lawyers. The problem is, that's not the right strategy. The right strategy is principle. But he doesn't have it. So he couldn't fight on that level. And the damage done is, is huge. The damage done to Microsoft was enormous. Uh, for years, uh, you know, Microsoft... Uh, couldn't innovate, couldn't advance, couldn't really build because it had a government-appointed, uh, a court-appointed bureaucrat sitting at Microsoft's office dictating what they could and couldn't do, couldn't couldn't say, which everybody who worked at Microsoft in those years will tell you. Everything shrunk, the scope of thinking. It's, it's a great illustration of the fact that force restricts thinking. Microsoft... And as soon as the bureaucrat was gone, Microsoft started flourishing again. And today, it's a very successful company. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. It, all it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share and uh, you can support the show at youronbrookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals. Uh, and uh, and show your support for all for, for for the work for the value hopefully you're receiving from this and uh, and of course don't forget if you're not a subscriber even if you even if you just come here to troll or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx uh, then uh, you should subscribe because that way you'll know when to show up you'll know what shows are on when they're on you'll get notified right so um, yes like. Share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.